Good evening, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to this prayer at the close of the day. It is Thursday. It is the fourth day of January, year of our Lord, 2023. It is the 11th day of Christmas, one more day in Christmas tide, and then, of course, Saturday is the Epiphany. We'll have the Divine Service Saturday evening at 6.30. We'll celebrate Holy Communion. I do pray this finds you well. Nice the sun came out today. It wasn't a horrible temperature. There are rumors of snow on Monday right now. That's how I'm going to treat them, rumors. But we'll keep an eye on the weather and let you know if we learn anything in the next 48 hours. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Tonight I am going to again turn to our prayer book of Scripture, that is the book of Psalms. Psalter, and this is the 65th Psalm. It is inscribed to the choir master, a Psalm of David, a song. And I am going to sing that for you. Praises due to you, O God, in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. O oh, you who hear his prayer, to you shall all flesh come. When iniquities prevail against me, you atone for our transgressions. Blessed is the one you chose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. By awesome deeds you answer us with righteousness, O God of our salvation. The hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, the one who by his strength established the mountains, being girded with might, who stills the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples, so that those who dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe at your signs. You make the going out of the morning and the evening to shout for joy. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their grain, for so you have prepared it. Your water, you water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges. Softening it with showers and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with abundance. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves. With flocks the valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning is now and will be forever. Amen. Again, that is the 65th Psalm. And that is, again, inscribed to the choir master, a Psalm of David, a song. And a beautiful psalm, and it really is a praise psalm. 
uh, praise is due to you. Hal uh, we hear these halal psalms. Uh, this is not considered one of those strictly, uh, but it is definitely a praise psalm. So we have what? We have praise is due to you, and then the psalmist is going to tell us why. Uh, sometimes I hear praise music, and what's interesting about the modern American church is that the focus often is taken off of God and put on us, meaning, you know, what I do, how much I love, how much I do this, as opposed to the whole source of these things, which is God himself. This, this psalm doesn't do that. It, 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 it focuses us, as all these psalms do, squarely to our God. Praise is due to you, O God, in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. You can think about how we live our life. Why do we live and try to live a Christian life? It's because of what God has done for us. It's not because of what God will do as a reward. It's already because of what God has done for us. I told this story in church, which I don't do very often, tell stories like this, but it's one that sticks with me throughout my entire life, just when I think about my own behavior. I think about when I got perpetually grounded. Uh, I, I'm probably still serving a couple of life sentences when I was a child. From when I was a, a young child, uh, I wasn't the most uh, well-behaved child. Uh, I'm ashamed. I do really stupid things, uh, but just being a dumb kid. Well, my I, I would disappoint my parents, and that was the worst. Getting a, a, a my parents were not violent and physical uh, in their punishments. I'd get the dreaded talking to from my father, you know, who I adored. And it was horrible to think you let him down and have him say that to you. And uh, and I get, you know, usually get grounded, especially as I got older. That was the punishment of choice. Uh, uh, like I said, I'm still serving a few of those life sentences. But after a few days, you know, whatever, however long the grounding was, my dad would usually say, go ahead. You know, he lived, he operated in the kingdom of grace, uh, mercy. And it was in those moments, however fleeting they might have been, and this is how it is with God. You know, I you know, was just so filled with love and admiration for Father because of his graciousness to me that, you know, I, I would do, I, I would try to please him. Now, sin reared its ugly head again, and, and I failed miserably, and, but still there was that grace. And this is the vows that we perform to the Lord because he is gracious and merciful. We go and look to his commandments and say, yeah, you know, we do take a vow in the church, if you will, we say that we would live according to his commandments. Why? Because of what he has done. Our confirmation vows talk about that. Now, there's plenty of forgiveness and we fail all the time. But, the, but because of what God has done, we live in such a way, we, this is the life of repentance that we, we acknowledge our great sins and his mercy and realize I want to I have the desire to do what the Lord would have me do because it is such a blessing for me and for my neighbors and then the psalmist continues oh you who hear prayer now we know our prayers are heard because of Jesus Christ so please pray pray frequently you know that God will hear you he has told you that for the sake of his son not because your words are flowery and many there's nothing wrong with flowery words there's nothing wrong with those short, heartfelt prayers. Lord, have mercy, or Lord, help them, or Lord, please. Prayers of exasperation, not knowing what to do. And we know he, he'll hear you. Or the deep problems that we face. I open, I don't open the paper anymore. I rare that I get a newspaper of any kind. But I open the paper by looking. I, I consume, I'm a large consumer of good quality news sources so I can stay informed as a pastor. And... Uh, as I wrote in my Christmas letter, it's like I, I, I wrote uh, metaphorically, and I think people got the point, but it was, you know, I, I've stopped saying I, I don't think this will happen. Because you know, who knows what tomorrow's going to bring, and things that seemed unthinkable when I was a young man are, are unfortunately quite thinkable. And anyway, you know, how, I, how can I solve such problems? Do I take up arms? No. You know, do I, what, you know, well, certainly there's things I can do. Petition my government, you know, hold, try to hold my elected leaders accountable. But I pray, because God knows how to solve these problems, according to his good and gracious will, and that's the wheel that counts. Now, um, O you who hear prayer to you shall all flesh come. When iniquities prevail against me, when my sin presses me, when my, you know, when, when, when in the weakness of my fallen flesh I, I succumb to temptation, when iniquities prevail against me, you atone, God atones 
for our transgressions. Uh, that's quite a statement, isn't it? He atones. Not that at one minute. Um, uh, please stop using that if it's your dead act. You know, that's not what the word means. Uh, uh, and I just don't like that kind of stuff anyway. You know, maybe that's just me being cranky and old. But think about the beauty of that sentence. You atone our transgressions. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. On, on him were all our sins laid. In him were our transgressions put to death. Our guilt is taken away. He has atoned for our sin. You atone for it. What a remarkable thing. It's sort of tucked in the psalm. You know, why do we give praise? Why do we do these vows? You atone for our transgressions. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. And that's you, me. How do you know it's you? Uh, does your good God outweigh your bad? No, that's bad grammar, sorry. Uh, need your good outweigh your bad? No, that's better. Uh, is it nice that our good outweighs our bad? Yes, but when you when you uh, start really counting that and, and, and making those scales up, you're going to find your good is never going to outweigh your your bad. Uh, that's why we don't uh, we don't have the naughty and nice list in that regard. Anyway, uh, how do I know it's me? That when I when I look to my own heart, how do I know that it's me who's saved? How do I know that I am chosen if it's not about my good outweighing my bad and me being more externally pious than my neighbor putting on the good show? Uh, how do I know? Well, you know the answer before I even say it, don't you? How does God tell you you become a disciple? How did he tell his church to go out and make disciples? Well, you know the answer. I'm going to say it anyway. Let's go to Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations. How? By baptizing, remember that's a participle phrase. It modifies the verb, disciple, make disciple. Um, you know you're a disciple because you're baptized. You know you're chosen because you're, you're, you're baptized. Remember the church, the word ecclesiastes, the, the word we translate as church, ecle, uh, ecclesi, uh, um, ecclesia, means to be called out, chosen out of this world. And how do you know it's you? And, it, and the mystery is that God wants everybody. But not everybody comes. You know, you know not everybody uh, uh, heeds that, or receives the gift in faith, or hears it and, and, and turns to it. Or uh, I'm trying to think of the right way to say this, but many turn their back on it. I mean, people, our, our roster is like every, every church roster that I know within it. This is, if you're listening to this, get your fanny in the church. Um, I'm telling you, uh, if you're unwell, and you can't make the church, of course, you know you call me. Many of you do call me, and I come and visit you regularly. I darn well better. If you got no excuse for not being in church other than you're lazy, get your rear end in the church. That's we are made and kept a Christian. And, you know, what does it say about people who are baptized and never set foot in church again? You know, like, like and I didn't finish this thought, but like many churches, Every church that I've ever been associated with and those that I know of, when we talk about these things as pastors, and we do because it weighs on us, uh, the ratio is about three to four to one. So uh, let's say we have 400 people on the roster. There's about 100 you'll see every week. Uh, some of those you might see at Christmas and Easter. Uh, when I say we see 100 every week, I'm talking about the people that come regularly. They might even come weekly. but They're, they're there once a month, but like that. You know, that's being generous. Uh uh, you know, and then the Christmas and Easter clan, the people that come on those two days, uh, you know, um, but there are people we never see and haven't seen in years. I don't know what to do about them and other than eventually we take them off the roster. That doesn't mean they're going to hell, but it means, you know, what does it say that you've turned your back on the gifts where Jesus says, you're going to do this. I want you to do this. I want you to be part of this. And yeah, you know, people say, well, I'm tired of hearing what the church teaches. I don't have a choice in that. Yeah, I, this is what I teach. I, I don't get to pick the things that we want to hear. I have to teach the whole counsel of God. So anyway, getting back to how do you know you're chosen? You're where, where God says he's going to be. You receive the gifts that he gives to you. That's how you know. Okay. Um, we shall be satisfied with goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. There's that locativeness of God. God says, I'm going to be found here. And he calls you to that place. He brings you to that place. And again, it says something when you say, nah, no, thank you. 
Okay, now I don't know when people lose their faith, but it becomes much harder for me to say anything at their funeral as time goes by, if I do their funeral at all, when they haven't set foot in church for no good reason in 20, 30 years. You know, usually they wouldn't call me for funeral, but let's say they do, maybe the family does. So what do you want me to say to them? And do I say, oh, okay. I mean, you think about that. You think, what does it mean you know, if you don't have to set foot in church and yet I can go to your funeral and do your funeral and say, ah, you know, stop your crying and be in heaven. Now, I have witnessed God converting people on their deathbeds. I've done baptisms in hospital rooms, through it, and, and I will happily preach those funerals. But I really can't do the funeral of people who I've never met and never seen in church, uh, unless they you know, are a member of a sister church or something like that. Why? Because what can I possibly say? You know, if they refused to come to the place where God says, I will be, what can I possibly say? You know, I, to, to bring comfort to the family. Again, God's the final judge in that. But you can see how that can, that can be also a big stumbling block to people. And I can't let that happen either. Um, but God, God establishes these things. You know, speaking of being chosen, you know, so you will know. You know, and you will know rightly, not just groping around or convincing yourself that you're saved because you feel it in your heart or you consider yourself more spiritual than religious. I'm not sure what that means. That can be defined any way you want, uh, which people often, you know, people say that. They're just saying, I don't want to come to church. That's just a nice way of saying it. Because God wants you to come, though, and hear the things you don't want to hear and hear the good news, too, that, you know, as you hear what you don't want to hear, he's there to bind up your wounds. So anyway, we'll stop there. But, you know, this prayer goes on, to, uh, this this prayer, this song goes on to talk about what God gives us. To, remember, everything is from God. Everything. Your health, your intellect, use it, use it in service to him as you love and serve your neighbor. Use it in service of your neighbor. The food in your belly, the bed that you'll climb into tonight, the blankets, the heat, the walls, the people who built walls, the, the people who you know, harvested the wood, it's all from him. And that's what the psalm is. Apart from telling us what God has done and how he is the one who atones for us, this is what the psalmist brings to us. Okay. Let's confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father, Almighty Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. For now you let your servant go in peace, your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people, a light to reveal you to the nations, and the glory of your people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we pray for the church and her pastors, that we would be faithful, my brothers and I, in our callings, that we would faithfully proclaim your word and forgive our many failures and our weaknesses. Pray that we resolve to know nothing among us but Christ and him crucified and the whole necessity of that crucifixion. We pray for teachers, deaconesses, other church workers, missionaries, especially my brother in Christ, Adam, and his family in Puerto Rico. We pray for uh, that you keep them safe and bless them as they proclaim the word of Christ in that place. We pray for all who serve the church, that their needs would be met and they would boldly proclaim the saving work of Christ our Lord. We pray for fruitful and salutary use of the blessed sacrament of Christ's body and blood that we have received this past Sunday and will receive this coming Sunday. As always, we pray for those who are crying out to you for healing. We pray for Myron, Dennis, Dave, Don, Ardo, Klaus, Lure, Pat, Pam, Cecil, Joan, Bob, Jenny, Luke, Aaron, Amy, Don, Fern, Allie, Allison, Scott, Ashley, Camden, Jason, Beth, 
Eric, Tom, Jim, Bob, Clint, Paul, Brad, Christy, Jeff, Marlis, Anita, Dave, Dylan, Karen, Sue, Tim, Bert, Heather, John, Chris, Lori, Don, Liberty, Joe, Phil, Katie, Michelle, Bethany, Luke, and all who are crying out to you. Lord God, Heavenly Father, according to your good and gracious will, place your healing hand upon them. Bless those who care for them, that they might be your instruments for their well-being. We ask you to bless those who travel to guide, guide their steps, that they may return safely to those to their homes and those whom they love. All this we ask in the precious name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Visit our dwellings, O Lord, and in your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body, soul, all things. Let your holy angels be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to sing 588. It's only two stanzas. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, he who died. Heaven's gates to open wide. He has washed away my sin, lets his little child come in. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. And that's 588. Jesus loves me. With that, my brothers and sisters, I bid you a blessed rest. By God's grace, we'll see you tomorrow night. Good night.